For the last two weeks, we've talked about pathways to intimacy with God. And as we wrap up the entire series, I want to talk about maybe the most important subject of the series, how to remove the barriers, the roadblocks that keep you from having a deep, intimate relationship with God. If you want that, stick with me. Welcome to this January 31st edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I'm Katie Kennard. This program wraps up Chip's look at a handful of Christian practices that have as much relevance for Christians today as they did centuries ago. So if you've missed any along the way, let me encourage you to take some time and listen through the entire series. Today, Chip's going to use a lot of scripture. So if you want to take a look at those for yourself, just tap fill in notes. Now here's Chip with part two of his message, how to win the battle for your soul. See, there's a world system that is eating our lunch. And you battle with it, and I battle with it. And the issue here is not, have we been deceived or seduced by the world system? The only issue is how much. And you know what the scripture says? Do not be conformed to the world, but how? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? That your life or your lifestyle could demonstrate or prove what God's will is, how, how it's really supposed to be, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus is speaking to us tonight with the same heart and love and compassion that he spoke to the rich young ruler. He's not down on us. These verses aren't in the Bible with a God going, bad boy, bad girl, clean up your act, shame, shame, shame. This is a God who looks at you and looks at me and looks beyond all the superficial stuff in the world and the world system and says, I got better for you. Don't get sucked in. Don't get seduced. Don't get deceived. Understand these paths of walking with me and talking with me and living in community, they're done in a very hostile environment. And the environment is so hostile that in the American church, nine out of ten Christians are completely seduced. The Gallup polls and the Barna polls show of all American Christians, 90% of them do not live differently, act differently, talk differently, divorce differently, marry differently, spend their money differently. They don't do anything differently than the world. And I want to ask you, how could that be? And I'm going to get on the solution side of this real quickly because I don't know about you, I can't take much more of this. But, you know, a good diagnosis is really important before we get to a good solution. How could that be? I mean, I, want, I, want, I wish all that stuff wasn't true. And, you know, Barna, his stats are wrong, and Gallup's had, you know, like many, many bad days. But they are true. The divorce rate among Christians, bankruptcies among Christians, it goes on and on. You ask me, how, what tool, what powerful tool, what means could the enemy have to engraft this world system in such a way that we don't even know it's happening to us? It's a way that's filled our minds and our images, and it has deceived and seduced, and, and the world system has been planted in the very core in the back of our mind. So there is a way that seems right to us. We think we're doing the right thing. We think we're going down the right track. We think we're doing it for the right reason, and the end thereof is death, and death means separation. And it means the death of kids with mom and dads. It means the death of marriages. It means the death of life in people's inner hearts and life. It means the death of purity that gives us access and power with God. And now I'm going to unveil it. Are you ready? This is what he's used. It's what he's used. Is it evil in itself? Absolutely not. This is what he's used. We have enthroned it in the center of our room so that we can all sit around and make it the object of our worship. And we bow down to it. It tells us what we don't have and what we need and what we need to drive and how we need to look. It tells us what's in and what's not in. In the average American household, it runs six to seven hours a day. It's become the new babysitter. And now we have little instruments that we can stick in it so we don't have to play with our kids, we don't have to talk with our kids, we don't have to teach our kids, we don't have to have family devotions, we don't have to deal with big issues. In fact, we don't even have to sit around a table and talk to each other anymore. We can keep it on and it can numb us to death. And I'm not talking about the violent, sexual, perverted, materialistic stuff that comes out of it. I'm talking about just even the good stuff. It has the power to numb your soul. And the world system comes pumping through it. And we get deceived and we get seduced. And, and if, if there's any doubt in your mind, just try. I used to say 10 days and no one ever makes it. Just try turning it off. Go home and unplug it for three days. 
And you'll, you'll realize there's, a, there, there's, some, so there's some level of addiction. You, you need to turn it on. I mean, you've got to know the news, right? Yeah, because the world won't go on unless you know what's happening. The names just change. It's about the same every night. Now, is this a stick our head in the sand, never watch TV, never read the paper, never watch a DVD? Is that the message? Absolutely not. But it is a message that says there is a world system, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There is deception going on. It's powerful when it comes through there. So you better have your game face on when you turn that on. And you better decide in advance what you want to watch, what you will watch, what you won't want to watch, and you better train your kids. And you better have a huge input of truth renewing your mind to counteract what you know is happening to you day in and day out. Okay, let's get on the solution side. How in the world do we overcome the world's barriers to intimacy with God? Okay, how in the world can we live Christ-like lives in a polluted world? Let me give you three very clear ways. Number one, it begins with a new attitude. It all starts with here. You know, it's a decision. It's a new attitude. And the new attitude is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And goes on to say, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now get this. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Now, have this attitude in yourself. Verse 5 is followed by verses 3 and 4. And verses 3 and 4 are a command. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but consider others as more important than yourself. Don't Think merely on your own stuff and your own things, but think of others as more important in yourself. And the example is, have this attitude that Christ had. See, the world system says, get, 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 put down to push you up. The world system says, I got to be number one. Jesus, who had all glory, says to us, consider others, be a giver instead of a getter. And he says, here's the example. He was exalted in glory. He didn't think it was wrong to have his deity veiled, some of his attributes veiled, so people would look at him differently. And then he came in the form, actual as a man. He lived a perfect life. He was obedient to the Father's plan, even to the point of death on a cross. Counter to, it's a paradox. And what did Jesus receive for his obedience? by being a humble servant and being a giver and a lover instead of a getter and a gainer. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and God will highly exalt him because there's a different economy we're going to learn about. And the different economy is God's economy and it is counter, it is anti, it is against, it is the opposite of the world system. Well, everything we learn from the world, if we do just the opposite, we'll be right in the center of God's will. And so it starts with a new attitude. The second is it requires a radical renunciation. This is, I think, some missing teaching in the church right now. It requires a radical renunciation. And, I, and you know, renunciation is like an old word, and you're bringing in one of those really old words, but it's such a powerful word, and it's packed with meaning. Because to renounce something means I've been in, I've been in step, and I'm doing this, and I'm going this direction, and you realize, whoa, that is wrong. I renounced that relationship. I had no idea that that group secretly was funneling money that was causing slave trading to occur over in Sudan. I renounce my relationship with him. I'm totally getting away from it. That's the idea. And Jesus calls us to renounce our relationship with the world. There can't be this, I'm going to be a really good Christian and plus Jesus plus the job I want and everything working out. Jesus plus uh, the socioeconomic standard that I have to have. Jesus plus, no, no, no. Renunciation talks about, God, I want your way, your agenda, first and foremost, and I trust you. Notice what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 to 25. And he was saying to them all, so this isn't for superstars, this isn't for pastors, this isn't for missionaries, this is for all Christians. Notice if anyone, if anyone wishes to come after me, what's this whole series about? Intimacy. Isn't that what coming after Jesus is? 
If anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to be intimate with me, if anyone wants to taste and experience my love and my passion and my power, if anyone wants to come after me, then notice he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Circle the word deny, circle the word take up, and circle the word follow. That's what renunciation of the world requires. You have to deny yourself. The world says, you deserve a break today. The world says, you ought to have this. The world says, you can't afford it, charge it. The world says, you got to put others down to get you up. The world says, you got to get the best. You got to be first. You should never have to wait. You're the most important person in the family. You're the most important person in the work. You're the most important person of everything. Life revolves around you. And Jesus says just the opposite, deny yourself. And then he says, well, how do you deny yourself? You take up your cross in one big emotional event. Is that what it says? You take up your cross how often? Daily. Why? What, what was the cross? I mean, we make it like this big religious symbol. Hey, the, the cross wasn't even used in Christianity as a symbol until 300 years after Christ died. When he's using it in this text, the cross, he could have said, take up your electric chair. He could have said, take up your lethal injection. The cross was an instrument to kill someone. What he's saying is deny yourself and then you put yourself under the spiritual knife daily and you die to you, your me first mindset. And you have the attitude of Christ and you say, Lord, what would you have me to do today? And then follow me. But then notice the reasoning here. Well, I love this. The words of Jesus are so cutting and so hard, but his motivation is so loving and so compassionate. Because what he knows is, as you follow the world, and I follow the world, and I have, and you have, the end thereof is death. And so he gives us the reason. It, this isn't like he's the super demanding. This is for, what's he say? For whoever wishes to save his life, do it your way. Me first mindset, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. And then he just, it's logical. He says, for what is profited of a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Or liter literally, it's his psyche or his soul, the real you. I mean, what's the use if you end up with the great car and the kids at the right schools and all the money and the 401k and the right looks and all the right surgeries and, and you're alone and empty and joyless and have no peace, and you're sitting in your big house with your big plasma TV with no one that really loves you on Christmas Eve with kids that are alienated with a divorce or two in the rearview mirror and no one gives a rip about you, but you sure look good on the outside. And Jesus says, the world system is a disastrous, deceptive, seductive plan to bring death and destruction to your life. And I love you so much. I don't call you to some mild little commitment. I call you to deny yourself. I call you to take up your cross on a daily basis and die to those desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and that need and that compulsion that you have and I have to be first and to be the center and to be arrogant and to pride in very, very sophisticated Christian ways, I might add. At least I've learned to do it in many of those ways. And then he says, deny yourself. I remember sitting next to a guy who uh, did one of the dot-com deals and sold his company and made $10, $12 million and, and then decided to go into politics, and that didn't quite work out. And uh, as happens with many dot-coms, the guy starts it, and then they bring someone else in to run it, and then he ends up with a whole lot of money and not a lot to do on his hands. And we were at a, a little banquet, and... Um, I met him a couple, three different times, and he looked at me, and he says, you know, I got, I got a problem. I got to discover, what should I really do with my life? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I did this, and I got all this money, and, you know, I want to be a good steward of it and this, but I, I want to really serve God, and then I want to be, and, but I want to be rich. I said, so what should I do? Because I'm not sure exactly what, what, what direction to go. So, you know, I said, so let me get this right. You want to serve God, but you really want to be rich. He said, right. I said, so, and you're asking me, what should you do? He said, right. I said, repent. He said, what do you mean? I said, repent. He said, I, I, I don't get what do you mean. I said, repent. It is the desire to be rich. 
It is the, at the root of many of evil that causes a man to pierce his very soul. If God would give you blessing and resources, enjoy them, be a good steward, you know, every good thing enjoy, give generously and, and use it for his glory. But if your desire is to be rich, that desire and being God's man are antithetical. And so we got a whole, whole group of Christians that want to follow Jesus and be rich, follow Jesus and live a certain way, follow Jesus and only do their things this way at these times. And you know what? It's, it's, it's what we call the evangelical American both and strategy. I want all that Jesus can give me on my terms, and I want my heaven here and my heaven there, and I want to do it my way. And God says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. And if he's given you capacity and ability for wealth, he will bless you with wealth, and you will understand it's his, but it can never be the, de the desire of your heart. It can't be what drives you. If it drives you, there's a God in your life, and it's the rich young ruler, and it means death. And so there has to be a renunciation. There has to be a point in time where you say, Jesus matters more than that stuff. And God, all these other things, in and of themselves, are they evil? No, but they can have no place. It can't be both and. A new attitude, a radical renunciation, and then here, it, you have to embrace a new economy. A new economy. And an economy is just how things work. It's a new paradigm. It's a new kingdom. It's a new system. There's a new set of values. There's new priorities. In the kingdom, you live differently. In other words, the whole world is like fish going this way, and you're the spiritual salmon going upstream, going upstream. And then you get tired. And, and actually, when you see all the other Christians going down this way, you think you're nuts. But here's the kingdom economy. The kingdom economy is threefold. The way to life is death. It doesn't make any sense. It, it feels suicidal, doesn't it? But what did the Apostle Paul say in Galatians 2.20? I've been crucified with Christ. What's, what's crucified mean? I died. And it's no longer I who live. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Did you, did you physically die? No. It's but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live... In other words, the life I live in my present physical body, I live in the flesh. How do I live? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's saying, by faith, I live in this body. My old man died. My new agenda and new economy, the way to life is death. I'm going to die to my desires, die to my will, die to my agenda, die to my future, die to my, dan my, my demands and my selfishness, and I'm going to say each and every day, God, what is your will? I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put others first by faith since you love me and died for me. By your grace, you will not withhold any good thing from me. So I'm going to walk with you. The way surrender leads to purpose, passion, and power. If we said it in our day, that's how I would say it. The way to life is death, and death really is surrender. When you surrender on a daily basis to God's agenda, it leads to purpose, it leads to passion, and it leads to the kind of power and the love and the joy that we're all looking for. But the way to get there, I'll tell you, is different. The second way uh, in, the, in the new economy is the way up is, you can write the word down. I mean, it's human. God created us. We want to be honored. We want to be exalted. We want to ha be in a position where we influence people for good and for right. And God says that, that ambition is not wrong. He says it's how you get there. Notice what Jesus said in Luke 9, 48. Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is the circle of the word least among all of you is the one who is greatest. Circle greatest, least great. You see the paradox? If you really want life to the fullest, die. If you really want to be exalted, if you really want to go up, the way to go up is down. Be a servant. Servanthood leads to exaltation and honor. Surrender leads to purpose, passion, and power. Servanthood leads to exaltation and honor. Can you imagine what would happen in your house if we started outdoing one another in servanthood? Who gets to do the dishes tonight? Mom, can I help out with this? Hey, honey, I'll take care of that. I'll go out and take care of that. What would happen? No, you watch this program. I got to choose last night. What would happen if servanthood became the byword of your family, of this church, of how you went to work? You know, I'll tell you, you will be exalted. You will be the best friend of many people. 
you will be the friend that everyone wants to be around. Does this mean doormat? No. But it means a servant's mindset. If you want to be great, be the least. And the final aspect of the new economy is the way to gain is to give. Jesus would say in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given unto you. It will be poured into your lap, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure or the size of cup or the size of basket that you give to others, it will be returned to you. Jesus says the whole world is about getting on top, being in the center, and gaining, gaining, gaining. And he says the way to get on top is be a servant. The way to gain is to give And the way to discover life is to die. Generosity is the gateway to genuine prosperity. True wealth. And by the way, God does not mind giving financial wealth to Christians. And financial wealth is not evil or bad unless it has your heart. And you always know if it has your heart is when he taps you on the shoulder and he wants to do something with it differently than you've planned. And by the way, the only antidote to greed is to be a giver. You need to systematically give and be generous with your time and your talent and your treasure. You need to give because me and you and the rich young rulers that are all sitting in this room are so prone by all these ads to get the next gadget and the, just the next big size house. Have you ever noticed if you're going to shop for a house or shop for a car that if you set a budget that the one you really want only costs about 2000 more? Right? I mean, if you say, we can afford a house like this, I'm guaranteeing you, add, add about 3%, and that's the one you really want. Why? It's called the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You are human. What's the antidote? The antidote is to say, God, it's not mine, and you give generously. And not just of your money. You give your heart away. And the way you give your heart away is you give your time, and you care about people. I love the prayer at the end, and we're going to close the series, and my uh, application is to encourage you to consider praying this for seven days, slowly, contemplatively, but um, one of the greatest radicals of his day, Francis of Assisi was an extraordinarily wealthy man whose father was extraordinarily wealthy. And as church history tells it, he had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ and took things extraordinarily, extraordinarily, literally. And as the story goes, I don't know how much is mythology and how much is true church history, he left all that he had. I mean, he left his father's wealth, he left his clothes, and as the story is told, he literally went naked and left all that he had and started with a group of people who said... Let's just do what the New Testament says. And so he says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. And where there's darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Do do, do you see how outwardly focused it is? This, This is a kingdom prayer. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled, get but to console, to be understood. Why didn't anybody come up and talk to me? And why aren't they asking me questions that I don't really feel apart? Not to be understood, but to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we're born to eternal life. This is the path of paradox. It will go against your grain and your flesh and the world system. And you will do it, and you will discover the life that is really life. And you will have joy like you can't imagine. You will have intimacy and answers to prayers that you thought were only for, quote, famous people out there somewhere, because God wants this for us. And he longs for you to get to experience his love at a deeper and greater level than any of us imagine. Chip's going to be back to talk more about the specific pathway to intimacy with God. But before he does, let me just say that in this series, you're going to be challenged to move beyond routines to the richness of real relationships with God and with others. Here's the thing, though. We rarely catch the important points just hearing a message once. So if Chip's teaching was helpful, let me encourage you to listen again if you're thinking about making some changes. To check out all the resource options for this series, just tap Special Offers. 
Hey, I'll be right back in just a minute, but I want to remind you that today is the very last day of this series, Pathways to Intimacy with God. And so if you've had a very good intention and if you thought to yourself, man, I am digging into God's Word and reading the Bible and I need to hear this again, go to the website livingontheedge.org, that's livingontheedge.org, and get the CDs, download the MP3s, uh, the message notes are there. Let us help you dig in and really walk with God. God bless you. Keep pressing ahead. Great idea, Chip. It's easy to listen again with the app, and if you want to encourage someone else, just tap the share icon and forward a helpful message. Your friend will be glad to know you're thinking about them. As we close not only this program, but the entire series, I've got to tell you that prayer of St. Francis, it's such a counterintuitive way of living, isn't it? I mean, it's a radical kingdom mindset, but it is transformational. And I just want you to know that there are ancient paths. There are people that for centuries and centuries have done life differently than everyone else. I remember being overseas and trying to explain this to a a group in Russia, and it was on a little bit different topic, but as I was talking, this quick picture came to my mind. They've been stuck in hundreds of years of tradition. It was very radical. And I, I said to them, what if from early childhood, you grew up and people got into their car, they put it in reverse, and everyone drove their car backwards. I mean, they would get in, turn, look out the back, and they would drive in reverse all the time. And they would hear the sound, you know, when they got going real fast, so no one went more than about, you know, 15 or 18 miles an hour. You know, they begin to laugh, but I said, if the only thing you'd ever seen in all your life, everyone drives backwards, you would think that would be normal. And I said, but what if it's not? What if the car wasn't designed to be driven backwards, but there's a whole new way? And, you know, they kind of chuckled with me. I think, by and large, the world for sure, and unfortunately that it breaks my heart, and I'm sure God's heart, is I think many of his children are going about driving the car of their life backwards. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to find life by getting. We're trying to get intimacy by taking. And God would say, you know, I long to speak to you. I love you. And the way up is down. And the way to life is death. And the way to wealth is to give. And when you live your life my way, there's the Spirit's power and there's joy and there's love. But it just doesn't make sense in this world system. And so God wants to speak to ordinary people. And I'd encourage you, maybe the way, because it's so radical, and maybe say to yourself, these paths are so different and so radical Maybe I need to study this for myself. My prayer for you is that you would enjoy the great depth of God's love and realize he wants to speak to ordinary people. He wants to hug you. He wants to care for you. He wants you to remember him. And he wants to do amazing things in an ordinary, regular person just like you and just like me. Just before we wrap it up, have you ever been listening and thought to yourself, You know, Chip, I wish we were visiting over a cup of coffee because I'd love to ask you about, and I'm sure you can fill in the blank. Well, your opportunity's here because during the month of February, Chip's going to be in studio every Friday to answer your questions about relationships. Through the month of February, his teaching's all about relationships, moms and kids, what God has to say about how to build great relationships and how to build a healthy family in a modern world. So every Friday, we're going to pause and give Chip a chance to answer your questions about relationships. To send your question, just email it to chip at livingontheedge.org. Well, until next time, this is Katie Kennard saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. Living on the Edge.